This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Another great guest today. I heard this guy speak a couple of weeks ago at the SECO conference, gave a great presentation. Uh, really excited to have him talk today. Please help me welcome my guest, Jose Garcia. Jose, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Absolutely. And uh, we actually met for the first time at a uh, sequel this time. So you and I had spoken a little bit before, but always good to put a, you know, physical body with uh, who we met over virtual at one point or another. Agreed. That's right. And yeah, you gave a great presentation and you thank partnered you. with Andrew Keel on that presentation. I was, I was fortunate enough to be in the audience for both of that, both of you guys. So I know a lot of your background, see you on social media, I know you're real involved in you know, the home part portion of the business, flipping homes, being a Lonnie dealer, working with park owners, working with customers. But tell us how you got into this and, and tell us a little more of your background. We'll go from there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I was uh, previously in corporate world, typical rat race America, trying to survive off a of salary. Uh, I actually ended up uh, climbing the charts in uh, one of the biggest logistics companies, which is Ryder, I guess we can pronounce it, uh, made it to the third level. But, you know, it's to me, one of the most important things has always been time and family. I, I like to, you know, push hard on that. And when you're in corporate and, you know, for each his own, but it's not there. Uh, more duties, more sacrifices means very little pay and less time away from, from your family and loved ones. So, you know, I've always kind of been interested in real estate. I think I watched every TV show there was about flipping houses, flipping condos and all kinds of, you know, and I was like, oh, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start flipping houses and condos and commercial. Only problem with that is you need capital or so I thought so much at the beginning. Being an introvert seven years ago when I started, not wanting to ask anybody anything, that didn't really help my case either. So, you know, I stumbled. I, I just kept doing the research, trying to learn here, going to YouTube like we're typically known to do. Um, and it just wasn't feasible. You know, many times I almost check myself out. You know, this there's a reason why everybody isn't doing it. You know, it's just not meant to be. And somebody in one of the RIAs said, do it with mobile homes. It's easier. And I just ran with it. And I'd grown, I grew up in a mobile home, but I didn't know how to rehab a mobile home. So, but I started looking into it. And sure enough, I saw prices like, wow, these are selling for nothing and compared to what I was looking in real estate. Long story short, I started uh, researching where can I find the most mobile homes, which of course, mobile home parks. That's what started popping up on Google and search. So I just started calling them. You know, I love to go back and hear what I was saying, because I'm sure it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, out of out of so many, one of them finally said yes. You know, I had gotten so many no's again, closer to the finish line of quitting is what it feels like many times. But one of them said yes, and I was almost surprised, like, wow, really? He said, Yeah, we got a few all uh, distressed fixer uppers. You can come check them out if you want to buy one, have at it. I was there first thing in the morning. So and that was my initial into what would evolve into so much more, but that first year, I ended up buying 10 mobile homes out of that same community, and I ended up rehabbing them myself while being a husband, while working in corporate America. One of the first reality checks I got is some of the hardest workers in America, contractors, don't like to work or don't like to show up. So I realized I'm going to have to rehab this myself. And I just it just went from one to the next one to the next one. That first year, I ended up with 10 rentals. Okay. And then from there, we've just scaled. So we do, you know, we do rent the owns now, offer financing, we flip them, we wholesale them, we move them. We uh, do Airbnbs, Section 8, you know, you name it. It's a list of, and it's just progressively, you know, seven years, we've come some ways. That's great. Yeah, I've had several guys do similar stuff in my parks. The challenge for me at the beginning, I'm sure this is part of your challenge, is convincing the park owner that it's a good idea for them also, because they don't want you pulling the home out. They don't want you creating a bad house. They don't want you renting to a bad resident. They don't want to take it back from you. So how do you, how do you talk to park owners to kind of cross that divide? Like, Hey, this is good for you. When, 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 when we get the third customer. Right. Well, luckily for me now, and I say this is I built quite a credibility, which has worked for me in my favor. Now it's, I have references, I have other, you know, it's there, it checks out. 
But I would say for anybody new, I mean, it's like one of the things a park operator doesn't like and who does really is losing control. And when they think of a Lonnie dealer or an investor coming into my park, you're going to buy one. You may rent the who knows who you may sell, you may move it. That's losing control. So one of the things that I mentioned highly, even in our first intro conversation is we do everything by your rules, your regulations, and you're in charge. We, we hold them above just a little bit more because we're not there to take over by any means. Got it. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And then um, just for everybody else that has, doesn't know, a Lonnie dealer is basically from Lonnie Scruggs, the book Deals mm -hmm. on Wheels or Wheel Estate, as it's sometimes called. But it's basically when you don't own the dirt, you rent it from the park owner, you own the house and you either rent it and, the, and you're basically subleasing the home or you're selling the homes typically on terms. And then you're going to have a spread in the middle and that, that, that spread is your profit. So um that's always the concern. One other concern that I have as a park owner that I've had to work with on Lonnie dealers is um, don't let them get too many homes because your financer, um, you know, your lender may not like that because in theory, they all move out at once. Well, then you got yourself a pickle. So you want to make sure as a landowner that you have a strong lease. What I do is I actually give the Lonnie dealers um, a copy of my home lease. And I say, you have to use my home lease. I'm giving you for free. It's a strong lease. Same one I use in my, my houses that I own, but then you, you have to sign my lot lease with me. And I'm a third party beneficiary of all these documents, at, at least third party. And then I can police your customer. So if your customer's got junk in the yard, I can give them a violation. It's going to also quote, be a violation for you, but then also your residents have to go through my screening procedures. So I kind of use it as almost like a mentorship program for the line. You're like, look, I'm showing you how I would do this and I'm yeah. doing it for my own self-interest that you don't screw things up for me, but you're going to get access to some documents, some screening procedures, et cetera. But you also can't move the home out, things like that. And a, and a sophisticated yeah. Lonnie dealer is going to want to um, sign a long-term lease if the require with the rate stuck, because it's not fair to you, Jose, is if I sign a lease with you and rents 200 bucks, you go ahead and you rent that house for 800. You think you're good. You do it 10 times. You think you're really good. And then I jacked the rent up to 400. And now you're like, whoa, uh, <laughs> by the time you pay for maintenance, you pay for taxes, you pay mm -hmm. for insurance, you've got collection risk. Yep. Um, and, if you're, and if you're vacant, you still got to pay the lot rent, um, yep. right? So those are just some other practical tips. What would you say is the your most common objection you get from park owners? Is it they don't want control or is it not moving out? What, what do they generally tell you? And what percentage yeah. of them are welcoming to you? Yeah, and to piggyback a little bit of what you said there, it's it's pros and cons with everything. You know, I like to say it's, you know, this is a win-win. I'm not here to, again, take over or I don't want to screw anybody. I don't want to get screwed. So, yeah, I know something like the lot rents like that. I mean, I, I'll do something as far as going seven to 10 years. I guarantee that the lots will be paid on time. Mobile home will not be moved. And if for whatever crazy reason it's moved, I will fulfill that agreement, but the lot rent has to stay at a certain amount or can exceed a certain amounts. So give and take, you know, give and take. But uh, I would say is definitely don't move the mobile homes. Um, and, you know, you think nobody will ever move the mobile homes, but we actually had a situation in South Carolina where we brought a Lonnie dealer. Uh, I didn't represent him. I more so was a mention kind of thing. And the guy, sure enough, came in, rehabbed it. And before three months, I think he moved it out of there. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's an issue. And you, of course, are well familiar with the cost of a new home permits and space. You know, that, that, that could be a fiasco when you have something like that. So uh, I think the biggest uh, rejection is uh, definitely securing something where the home cannot move. Yeah, makes sense. So tell me, tell me how you find your end buyers and what, you know, pros and cons or challenges you have with them. And I'm curious, do the end buyers know that you don't own the land if you're a line dealer? Do they care or is, is it ever a hurdle? No, it's not an issue. We're pretty transparent. I mean, typically it's like, you know, I am an investor inside of this community, whatever it may be. We own the homes, not the lot. So there's still a lot rents. And of course, we break all that on agreements. Uh, as far as finding them, 
that's not very hard. <laughs> you know, there's a high need of affordability housing and it's growing. So I tell every mobile home investor, if you can't find an buyer, something is wrong and it ain't the client. It's your, something is off with your, you know, your, your branding. Uh, but it's typically social media. It's and of course, the more you do it, the more you start lining up more potential buyers or residents where you start getting what some people call a good problem. Now I have too many buyers, not enough product. Well, then get more products so that you can have for the buyers that are there. So uh, screening wise, uh, I was uh, grateful to I just became part of a rent fodder. I actually have a call with them soon, so I'm very blessed on that. But up until now, it is typically go to your local police department and have them or you share us a full background on that. Or we were using other sites like uh, Rent Prep. It's not a bad system. Dot com. And again, we just review it. But anything we review, we approve or not. If it's if it's horrible, well, we're just going to end it at that. Uh, and when I say horrible, it's obviously criminal. More so, cr credit we're not as focused on. Uh, but we do share all of our backgrounds with the park owners and let them make the final decision of yes or no. Got it. Now, what states are you currently operating in? All Southeast, North South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, and Georgia, where I'm at. We just dipped into Arkansas, Jonesboro, Arkansas, and we're going into Louisiana probably in two weeks. My goal in the next five years is nationwide. So, Okay, got it. So I'm in five states right now where I own parks. None of them are the same that you have. So <laughs> I can't hire you, right? I can't work with you. I can't partner with you because we're in different locations. So help me as a park owner. Uh, figure out if the next Jose or John or Steve or Bob or Susan help me determine if they're the right person or not, because I know that that's another nightmare concern for a park owner is, yeah, Jose seems like a nice guy, talks a good game, but what's, every, you know, and he and I have a contract that says he's not going to move the home out, but how, how would I, how, how would you advise me to vet the potential home flipper or Lonnie dealer in my park? Absolutely. Full thorough interview. And nothing less of, because you're right. Everybody sounds good on the phone. Everybody checks out on paper. But when it comes to the needy greedy, now we got problems and we see that a lot. So I would tell, I would advise any park owner is look at it almost really like a marriage. You don't want to overdo anything at the beginning and giving somebody, here's all my homes as they, okay, you're here to solve my problem. That could be a nightmare waiting to happen. So I would say, start with one home after you fully interview them you want to make sure if they're in real estate investors do you actually have experience with mobile homes real estate as you know for and mobile homes are two different animals two different type of clientele it, it's two different worlds so i want to make sure that somebody coming into our communities they are knowledgeable or they can be coachable if nothing more uh, and they're there more so looking out for the park as much as their their selves should I, I agree with you that to do one at a time, what what should I do and what's reasonable as far as vetting their financials? I mean, because I've had issues where people will say, yeah, I'll, I'll rehab this house. I'm like, this is a gift them free. Like, this is a handyman special. It is not livable. We're not willing to make the lease, let the lease say you're not allowed to, you know, enter. You're not allowed to live in the home until the city signs off. So we want you to make sure it's livable. And then we've had guys move in and they don't finish it, right? And we got to get it back. It's a big pain. So you know, how much money should we expect from these guys? Or do we do, if, am I going to turn them away if I say, I want to see 5,000 in checking or 10,000? I've had a lot of guys say, oh, I, I can do sweat equity. And you can sweat equity cleaning out a home and you can sweat equity paint, but you can't sweat equity a furnace and appliances. <laughs> you know, you can you can get cabinets pretty cheap from Goodwood, from the Habitat store, but you can't find a cheap water heaters you can't find cheap refrigerators you know hvac system or not not that cheap so when I, that's where guys have struggled is when they get through the lipstick flip they're like oh crap the infrastructure bad on this house mm -hmm. i would say a minimum ten thousand for and i'm a park owner now also myself and it's like look we, we keep talking about it's a win-win we look at it from every angle but at the same time it's like these are opportunities a park operator telling a Lonnie dealer come into my park and be able to sublease the homes and get them for, like you said, nothing. There is no reason why the uh, Lonnie dealer does not have to meet certain requirements. I would say you have to show me proof of funds of at least 10000 to get started. And again, once you do one and go to the next one, you know, then it becomes a simpler thing. But, you know, starting out, I would be I would have some pretty strong requirements. 
No, I think that's I think that's prudent and that and that certainly um gets rid of a lot of the bad apples. I mean, the other thing that we've done is if we give away a handyman special, is we'll require six months lot rent paid up front. There you and, go. And and or we will paint the house. We'll make it look good from the outside. We're like, we're gonna put in the it's a free house, but we're gonna re repaint it, we're gonna skirt it, we're gonna put a deck on it, and that's gonna cost two thousand dollars. So we need you to add two thousand dollars to your lease payments over the first 12 months and then we get the money back in the form of lot rent but then we just gave them the house we didn't sell it to them because we don't want to get into more warranties of habitability and things of that sort now some states you can't but do that some states pay, you can. I mean, you're securing that they get it done because you're doing it obviously so it gets done and gets done right absolutely yeah. because what i've found is a lot of these lining dealers they want to or just home flippers you know whatever you call them they they want to do what's necessary to get the home occupied and beneficial for them, which I get. And most people care about the inside of the house. They don't care about the outside of the house. Um, I mean, that's part of the benefit of mobile homes is from a sales perspective is on the inside, they look pretty nice, nice homes on the outside. There's not a lot of character and design, especially in a single wide, even today, the single wide today compared to 20 years ago, it looks the exact same. <laughs> especially once they started having vinyl sing vinyl siding in a shingle roof i can't tell the difference between a 2002 and a 2022 if they're both clean right on the inside they're much nicer so what these line dealers want to do they only care about the inside well guess what if i'm the park owner i want to i care about the outside too it doesn't have to be a beautiful double wide with the built-in porch and a um you know uh cupola on the top and uh, you know but dormers and everything but I care that it has to be clean, power wash, painted, skirted, and, you know, decent yard. Um, so that's one tip that I have for people is just, you know, make sure that the Lani dealer is going to make sure that gets taken care of. And the way that I found it is we just paint it for them and we just do it for them and then we bill them. And then yeah. we don't give them title typically until they've uh, performed the contractual obligations. Good. Good. That, that's a whole nother security also. Absolutely. And I mean, and you're good with documents, obviously, but uh, even another thing, too, is like, you know, if you do not perform certain tasks or duties, you know, you forfeit the home. You know, this is again, it goes back to a requirement of you have to meet certain ones. Yep. Yeah, I kind of have gotten to the point where it's a it's a conditional sale. You know, if we sell, we're selling the house for five thousand. It's, it's, it's an option for the first five months. If you finish the renovation at the end of five months you get to buy the house for five thousand now a lot of guys don't like that but it's like look that way if you don't perform i don't have to foreclose on you you just failed to meet the conditional steps of uh consummating the purchase contract yeah what other what what other tips do you have jose them I mean, as far as getting in the business or just lessons learned or maybe if you got any fun stories either as far as like what's gone well what's not gone well I would say educate yourself as much as you can. You know, seven years ago when I got started, there was no mobile home investors. It seemed like there's always been park owners, mobile home investors, but it was very low key. Unlike today, you see yourself, you got podcasts on it. There's other people teaching on it, wholesale, flip, and, you know, there's more and more of that coming along. So being able to pick up and learn even some simple fundamentals before getting started is only going to help you. Uh, so definitely, you know, reach out to Bert. Maybe he can help you out or learn from somebody who's already in the space doing it. Uh, I would say that, you know, success leaves clues. So pay attention to that. Uh, funny stories. Uh, many. <laughs> We can talk about tenants or, I mean, this, you know, mobile home investing, it's his own world. That, that's for sure. I mean, it's just like, it's, there's never a dull moment, it seems like. Right. Yeah. Lots of craziness in this space, for sure. Let me ask you this. Do you have, do you have any interaction with the city officials or government as part of your role? Like, do they ever come and say, hey, what are you doing here? Or when you, when you need to upgrade an electric box or something, is, are you doing it on your own? Is the park owner involved? Have you had any issues with that? Yeah, good question. And funny enough, we're actually dealing with that right as we speak in central Georgia. Where, um, well, my park, for instance, the one we bought, two of the mobile homes have been centered for a while. So we actually had to do a whole another inspection. We had to bring an electrician to get new permits and pull all that. It wasn't cheap by any means. But in other communities where we only own the mobile homes, then, yeah, that would be more towards the park operator to handle that part. Yeah, I think that's that's good to make sure you work out because I mean, I recently sold 
um, sold one home and gave away one home in a, a, a park here in Missouri. And I know that the city has to is going to make us upgrade the electric pedestals. So it's like 3000 yeah. a piece. So yeah. I made sure to disclose that to the guy like, hey, this is good. You're going to have to pay for this one. I'm going to pay for this one. But our guys will do the work because we already have the electrician with the city and all that stuff. But like, you're not able to jump in this house and start working on today. Or if you do, you're going to do it without electricity. So, you know, just be aware, you know, and, and we can delay lot rent for a couple months, things like that. But I know that in the past, um, there's been issues if we sell a home and, and it's, then there's, it's go through the city process. Well, the park owner ends up getting in the middle of it. And if the, you know, and if there's a cost, and, and we hadn't discussed who's paying for what, it leads to problems. So again, you mentioned yeah. transparency. That's always helpful. Like, look, this house has no power. It's going to cost $3,000 to get power. And you can't use your buddy who knows how to put in ceiling fans. You got to go through the real process. Yeah. I'm going to have to sign off. I'm going to have to get the, you know, I got insurance. I got an electrician, all that. But this is part of the cost of the home that you're going to have to bear. Or we're going to build it in the price. I'll do it. And then that's why I need more money because it's, you know, because it's, the home is worthless in its current place with no power. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right, Jose, what else, uh, what else do you want to share? Any ideas or tips or otherwise, how do people find you? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Y'all can connect with me, um, GarciaMHU.com. That's actually our website where you can send us a direct email to j at GarciaMHU.com. I do help uh, everyday investors get into this. So, you know, you mentioned you have more homes in certain states that we're not in yet. I may not be able to tackle on yet, but it does not mean I may not have what I call students in those states areas yet that I could definitely align y'all with. So, you know, I, I think this mobile home industry is a beautiful thing. I, I do. I, I love I've gotten into it. And I mean, it's just seeing the involvement of so many more people also getting into. So any way I can work with y'all, absolutely reach out to me. All right. Sounds sounds good, Jose. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Ferg. Got it. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review, and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.